Welcome to another edition of Forecast Lab. The climate index, as we'll get that out of the way, we are officially in El Nino. What we've really seen is more shades of gray. The transition to El Nino has been very gradual, but by fall and winter, we are looking at a very well-developed pattern. And the Madden Julian oscillation is indeterminate, so we're not going to worry about that for today. There's a current look at the surface chart. It's very active for June. We do have a lot of cool air pushing down through the eastern U.S. We've got 50s up there in upstate New York, quite a bit of showers, some of that producing a little bit of very small hail, and some lightning, especially around Boston, back to Albany, and down into Connecticut. Around the periphery of that, some smoke. The majority of that smoke has pushed on off into the Atlantic, but we do have some residual pockets hanging around in Ohio, Indiana. I haven't plotted all of them, but, you know, there's one right there, and a few more down around Paducah, Kentucky. There's a closer look at the northeastern U.S., a classic cold air advection pattern, lots of open cell cumulus, this tends to be very diurnal. And you can see this flashing of green. That's going to be the GOES GLM lightning detection system. So all the way from Maine, especially down to Boston, and back towards State College, Pennsylvania, they are getting some lightning. And in Michigan, the drought continues. Very low vegetation moisture and low relative humidities. So they do have some red flag warnings around that part of the country. For the southeastern U.S., well, I've replaced the flash areas with the flash locations. So this is sort of detecting the strikes. The way this works is not with radio triangulation like with the Visela and NLDN network. It doesn't work like that. It literally detects optical flashes on the top of the storm. So that's really not going to give you a precise location. You're not going to use this to map down what neighborhood and block got hit, but it will give you a general idea of what part of town is getting the heaviest strikes. Let's zoom in a little bit on that area. And it is a well-developed cluster of multi-cells moving south around, I guess, uh, St. Augustine through Gainesville and over towards Apalachicola. A little bit of weakening. I mean, you can look at the trends as these move to the southeast. You can kind of pick out which cells are becoming less active. So here, a little bit of a decrease. But in the mainland part of Florida, let's see, this cluster also weakening a little bit, but the heaviest activity moving towards the east coast. Further south, rather stable across much of that part of the state, but around Lake Okeechobee down towards West Palm Beach, maybe a little bit further south, a few active cells and some weaker stuff down around the lake. And as far as Puerto Rico goes, their record for the date is 94 degrees. At the current time, 93, but the last hour they were up to 95, so it looks like they broke their record for the date. It tends to not really get that hot in that part of the tropics. There's a lot of moderating influences, one being the ocean, the other the considerable amount of ground moisture. So you don't really get those hundreds like we have in the subtropics. Now this represents a massive change from the past week or two. We had a lot of tropical activity across Texas, very weakly capped. Numerous cells would go up every day somewhere in Texas, but this looks a lot drier. And we see a little bit of a sea breeze down here. A weak cell in the hill country, looks like around maybe Kerrville. But out to the west, here is the approach of a shortwave disturbance. We can see that a little bit better on the water vapor imagery. And there it is. You can really pick out that common cloud circulation, the dry slot working in behind. And you can take that and resolve that with some of the upper air indications. Here's the corresponding 500 millibar heights and vorticity. The chart is a little bit noisy. These models, they do tend to pick up a lot of interference from the mountains. But we do see higher vorticity right there and definite troughing. So that's broken up as well by a mountain wave. However, this little area right here, that's the trough. So we do have a good estimation, the east-west position. Now this is going to be 0z. So this is what it's forecasting 
in a few hours. So going by this, we would expect the clouds to be about like that. So coming through Pecos, Midland, Roswell, and down to the Big Bend. And that's probably about where it will be in several hours. So we're looking for it to be in this area here, and that's going to just about match up when this wave gets to about here. So let's take a look at those trends overnight. At 0Z, zero zero, right around dusk, that's the wave right there. Overnight into tomorrow morning, we find it in the panhandles. Now much of the lift is going to be between that trough and the downstream ridge. So this whole area will be subject to upper level lift, and that will help remove any capping and steepen the lapse rates. By 18Z, we find the wave right about here, maybe a little bit further to the east. And then by evening, there it is right there, some convective feedback out ahead of it. And there's the SPC outlook for tomorrow and enhanced risk for northeast and east Texas. And now you know how that got there. Everything else comes down to the details. Instability, theta E, and the position of the boundaries. The central and northern plains, numerous thunderstorms, all the way from the Rockies and the Front Range down into the flat areas of the northern plains. Now, the only real problem spots are going to be around the slight risk in southwestern Kansas, probably is this stuff around Pueblo and Trinidad rolls eastward. The main threats there are going to be high wind. Further north, the Weather Prediction Center has a moderate excessive rainfall category for west central Montana. We've had week after week of rain up there. It's just been going on every time we do the weather cast, we find rain up there. Now, fortunately, the heavier rain has fallen on a rather sparse area, mostly ranch land, and I guess they do maybe some winter wheat, that kind of thing up there. However, all that drainage is into Fort Peck Lake, which is right in there. And some of you may remember a dam failure back in 1976. That was uh, big headlines, and hopefully they've planned for that, and we're not going to see anything like that this time around. The southwestern U.S. looking fairly dry. Now, it is pretty obvious that they are under the influence of the prevailing westerlies. We can look at the water vapor imagery and see that. Everything moving from west to east. Now, typically what we see in June is the appearance of the subtropical ridge from Mexico, and the flow down here tends to weaken, and we start seeing the infiltration of moisture from west Texas and northern Mexico. We definitely do not have that pattern going on right now, but we are looking for a transition maybe in the next few weeks. And we'll see the appearance of the southwest monsoon in New Mexico and eventually into Arizona, the Four Corners, and Utah and Nevada. And in the northwestern U.S., a cool pattern. Still have a cold air advection pattern. This is all modification of the maritime polar air mass as it moves inland. And there it is, 50s and 60s all through the Great Basin area. We look at the thickness lines and we see this thermal trough extending down the Pacific coast and some of that extending inland as well. So if I lived up in that area, I would probably call this a very pleasant weather pattern. It's definitely better than 90s and 100s. And then going further up north into British Columbia, you probably remember what happened back in, I think that was 2021, they had those awful wildfires and 120 degree heat. Fortunately, a much different pattern. But as we go up into Canada, plenty of wildfire smoke. The worst of it right there around Fort Nelson up into the Mackenzie River Valley and quite a bit of smoke as well through the prairies. In Alaska, cool weather in the Brooks Range, continuing to push polar air into the North Slope region and rather mild around Fairbanks down towards Anchorage. And they are under the influence of onshore flow coming from this Bering Sea system. Then further out there into Canada, looks like below normal temperatures, only 20s and 30s, 
Got 28 up there at uh, Resolute and the freeze line all the way through Baffin Island and into Victoria Island. Some rather low thickness values up north, producing some snow in the Labrador Sea. High pressure coming down into the prairies. That's going to drive cold air into the, the Dakota and Minnesota region and bring some of that smoke all the way down into North Dakota and surrounding areas for tomorrow. Okay, really shifting gears here. Let's take a look at the NHC forecast. Nothing expected over the next seven days. However, some possible developments coming together in the Caribbean. This starts out today. This is how it looks right now. There's the North Atlantic High, 1021 millibars. You can see that flow coming all the way from Africa, from the, I guess, the doldrum region into the Caribbean. And looking west and east along that area, don't see any big waves. We have to go way out there into next week and towards the weekend of the, I guess, 18th and 19th. And you're going to watch this area here near Cuba. You can see it's already getting a little bit unsettled east of Costa Rica and Nicaragua. So what's going on there? Let's take a look. Yeah, a little system coming together right there, some precip developing. This is going to be on the 17th, and that tracks up into the area between Jamaica and, I guess that's Honduras, and that moves on up, develops into a closed low, possible tropical storm. That's the last frame I have. This is where the model gets very iffy, and we're not going to worry about that because they're very bad at handling these systems beyond 168 hours. But I've seen a range of tracks all through here. We're just going to have to wait until this works itself out, and there could very well be no system at all. And the only real sanity check that we have is the European model. This is the CMWF, HRS, and what we see is, yeah, some unsettled conditions down there in that same region. And as we get into the 18th and 19th, something coming together. But looks like by the 240 hour point, the 19th, it is not putting anything out there around Cuba and the Yucatan. So definitely some discrepancy, and we'll just have to see what happens for next week. So let's take a look at the NAM and check out the weather over the weekend. What we see here is southerly flow coming up from the Gulf. There's the 1004 millibar line. There's the 1008. So that's going to support southerly winds, helping to feed moisture and warmth into this leaside trough around Denver and Cheyenne. And of course, we also have that short wave right about there. That's the cloud field associated with that. You're going to see that drift eastward. The model going for a little bit of generation of precip around Sweetwater around midnight. So kind of a different outcome from the ARW. And then as we go into tomorrow, there, there's the map at dawn. There's midday, and then we start getting the convection breaking out there around Dallas. So that's going to be fed by southerly flow due to the northwest component. The hodographs will be curved, and there's just enough shear to support some severe weather and organized storm structures. We also have a front coming in from the north. I haven't taken a close look at that, but we do have cold air flowing into the Dakotas, bringing that smoke on down. And there could be some strong storms along that boundary. And this is kind of interesting out here off in the Atlantic, off of the Bahamas into Bermuda. Looks like a little river of moisture, maybe associated with the subtropical jet. And then going into the rest of the evening on Saturday, MCS moving south through Texas. And another MCS through Missouri associated with that other front coming down south out of Canada. And there's the charts for Sunday afternoon, a weak frontal system pushing into Oklahoma, a bear clinic low right there in the Ohio River Valley, warm front into Ohio, so there could be some strong storms in that area right there. And that front trails all the way back into the Rockies and into southwestern Wyoming. Continues to be unsettled out there in Nevada, 
Cold air continues flowing south into the central plains. Would be great to have some of that cool air. But this time of the year, no, we're not going to see that down into the Gulf region. Got to wait for October for that. So let's take a look at those highs over the next few days. This is going to be the highs on Saturday, some very warm weather. Probably got downslope starting to set up there in Texas, so temperatures up to 100 around Midland and Del Rio, 97 at DFW. Then going into Sunday, continued hot from DFW down towards the hill country, and very cool air coming down into Chicago, 64 for a high there, and 67 at Denver. And on Monday, kind of a continuation, but more cold air spreads into Kentucky and Tennessee and into the Appalachians. Tuesday looking very pleasant all the way from Ohio into the Rockies, but look at that up to the north, paradoxically, some very hot conditions, almost 90 degrees up in that region, and continued hot in Texas, 109 at Laredo. Very similar picture on Wednesday, hundreds around San Antonio, and same thing on Thursday. So a little bit of a heat wave developing in Texas as we go into the latter part of next week, and some very hot temperatures as well in the northern Red River Valley. A couple of weather notes of interest. We do have a tropical cyclone in the Arabian Sea. Biparjoy, that's the name of the storm. Currently looking at uh, somewhere around 65 knots, and it is tracking northward. Looks like that's going to make landfall around Karachi, Pakistan. This is the Pakistan-Indian border. So some of that will affect the westernmost parts of India. So there's the infrared imagery on that storm. Just basically a central dense overcast, no eye indicated, and that's just continuing to push north. And some extreme heat in parts of India and Nepal. This is the chart from 08Z from near peak heating. You can see a lot of readings up there from 106 to 109. And there was a station in Nepal somewhere in this area, Janakpur. They reached 109, breaking their all-time record. And they had an overnight low there of 84. So that's with the humidity. You can see those dew points in that region are in the 50s and 60s. So I'm sure that was very unpleasant. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I'm going to leave you with some footage taken around San Antonio in the Texas Hill Country. Thank you very much to Greg for this footage. And thanks to Bob Little and Barbara Little, our newest supporters. Thank you very much for that support. Hope you all have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday for the live stream for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Have a good one. Bye-bye.